Thank you, Provost, and all of you for coming to hear whatever it is I decided to talk about. <laughs> if you haven't already, if you do have a mobile device, this would be a great thing to work on while I'm starting to introduce the topic, would be to go to one of these two sites. If you have an app, you can go with the Socratic Student app, or you can just go to the website v.socratic.com. You'll be asked to enter a room name. Today it's Rasa Nova, with Nova for innovation. Yeah. Rasa Nova. Oh, and That's okay, I'm trying to innovate. And then you can join. There's a three question survey, and I'd love to get some feedback from you. I can see so far that about eight people have completed that survey. So, so I decided that. By virtue of having received an innovation award from the provost, I should probably talk about, as you heard, innovation in the classroom, not about other sorts of innovation, like innovation in research or scholarly or creative activities. So I'm going to explain briefly how I go through a day in class. And this is essentially a life cycle of my class, starting from about 10 minutes before class begins. When students walk into the class, 10 minutes before my class starts, minus 10 minutes, they start doing what some of you are doing now and taking a Socratic quiz that informs me what they know coming into the class. And then this next icon, explain everything, reminds me that that's the app I'm using to present right now. Reminds me to hit the record button so that I start recording what I'm doing on my iPad and the audio in the room. So the students are going to have this as a resource after the presentation is completed. After that, I get to give some feedback based on the Socratic quiz results from the students. I can see what they know, what they know, and I can customize in the classroom on the fly the experience that they have in the class by what sorts of questions of theirs I decide to answer. About halfway through the class, I'll usually distribute some sort of electronic activity, usually through the app Google Classroom, an app to read all of us on campus. And they will engage in some active learning often in small groups in that process during class, after which we do some Q&A based on what they understood or didn't understand during that exercise, whatever it may be. And at the end, I usually ask some sort of wrap-up questions, again, using this app or website, Socratic, to assess what do the students feel like they learned well, what questions do they have leaving class, and so forth. Then outside of class, I'll have students working on collaborative projects, often in Google Classroom, apps like Google Docs or Google Sheets where multiple students, once they go home or wherever they go after school, can log on to the website and work together on creating this semester in my genetics class, the perfect set of notes for every chapter in my genetics class, or group definitions. So can your group, small group, two to three students, maybe four, come up with the best definition of the key vocabulary I <coughs> from that chapter? We can do online office hours using Zoom, which again we all have for free here at Fresno State. It's online teleconferencing software that's really easy to use and really powerful. Then I also have been recording, as I am now, recording lecture material and also, also pre-lecture videos that I ask the students to watch before class. So down here at the bottom in the outside of class section, they watch videos, they use open resource, open educational resource free textbooks instead of purchase textbooks. And by virtue, he, by virtue of having watched these videos on YouTube, I can get some analytics information about whether the students watch, what they watch, and what they watch over and over and over and over and over again, which gives me feedback to tailor the next <laughs> class. So they have to watch these videos before the night, by the night before, I say 11.59 p.m. and 59 seconds, you have to watch the video for the next day, and I wake up in the morning on the next day class, and I see what did they watch, what didn't they watch, and I can maybe predict what's going to happen in class. So that's a day in the life cycle of what it might happen in class. Quick review, there was a pre-lecture video, by the way, hopefully everybody saw the link on the invitation from the provost's office to attend today to watch a rather long video that I produced. This is my pre-lecture video for you today. Here's a quick review. Three reasons to use technology in the classroom. Efficiency, 
So students can conduct, this is Dr. Golder from our department, students can conduct interviews with experts and they even inform the students in the class during class. We don't have to have Dr. Golder in class to give her expertise. It's fun. The students enjoy being able to take out their iPhones, smartphones, whatever, taking pictures of microorganisms through the microscope objective. And fantastically, it keeps you engaged with your colleagues. It gives opportunity for travel and for having fun and getting to know faculty that are interested in improving classes with technology outside of your department, outside of your college. So there's three reasons I enjoy innovating at Fresno State. <laughs> and then it got deep. I love to serve, and that's one of the reasons I really like faculty professional development. It's a passion, aside from biology and research and genetics and all of that. It might be because I used to be a Boy Scout, and it's also because I'm sort of just crazy. And when I see people innovating, like the slats from this bench are missing, but somebody has strung some caution tape across to make sure nobody sits down. Of course, I'm the first person that goes and tries to innovate and see if that's actually a tenable seating position. It wasn't. This is before. I'm not going to show you what happened after. But really, my goal here today, since you all decided, thank you very much, to take your time to come listen to the two of us talk today, was I want you to be able to take something useful with you after you leave. And I want it to be applicable to you. And that's one of the reasons that I've provided a handout, which you don't have to have with you right now, but you can pick up on the buffet table as you leave if you want. It's got a little outline of some questions to think about if you decide to innovate something in one of your classes, or if you're staff or an administrator in your offices, not necessarily in your classes. So briefly, I just want to touch on, and I love analogies, an analogy about innovation. So I'm going to boil this down pretty quickly to a few key observations I've made about how to innovate. I thought about titling this talk, One Weird Old Trick to Innovation, like those internet white websites, but innovation's weird because it's, I don't think, something you can define. You can't say this is how to innovate. It's almost, by definition, unable to be defined what innovation is. So how am I supposed to stand up here and talk about innovation. I can do my best to share what I think. When I was younger, one of the trips we took, 93 or 94, I think, from Oregon, we drove up I Interstate 5, we we're going to go climb Mount St. Helens. So this is getting to the title of the talk today. And I found that, so innovation, climbing this mountain is going to be the analogy here. So initially, for all of us probably, innovation seems like a surmountable task. Oh, from afar, yeah, sure, we can climb that. It's not too steep. Most of the top's gone, yeah. which I was alive for, but don't remember. I was in Oregon at the time. I, all I know is there was a lot of ash. So then we get to base camp, which is only about 3.3 miles as the crow flies from the rim. And so it seems like, okay, if I want to climb the mountain, it's pretty straightforward. I have a clear goal. Then you start climbing, and you get into the rocks and the boulders, and you realize that there's, it's not as easy as a float. So then you realize that although it's 3.3 miles horizontally, it's also almost a mile climb to go from base camp up to the rim. And you start thinking, oh, this is rough. So what I'd like you to do, and this is the exercise that starts this sheet I have back there, is just to think briefly, and I'm going to keep talking, briefly about an obstacle that you think you could solve if you had somebody to collaborate with or to get feedback from, as well as a few other tools, time and technology. So if you had some time set aside to discuss how to solve a problem, and you had people to discuss it with, what would be the first thing be on your list? Think about that. And by the way, if you want to download, for those of you that are enabled with the, your apps, you can download this worksheet online. One of the things I really like about teaching technology. Less paper in the classroom. So eventually I didn't make it to the top. You're rewarded with a view once you get to the rim of Mount St. Helens. Fantastic day. It took a while though. And there was a lot that I learned on the trip to the top. So before we get there, Brief background on me. 
read it there on the right side by yourself. Like, I did not have any professional training in teaching until I got to Fresno State. I was a typical scientist. We're not taught how to teach, most of us anyway. Some of us are. But my father is a biology instructor. He has been, he was the first faculty member hired at Linventon Community College in Oregon in 1968. He's still teaching there. Botany, ecology, geography. So I grew up around teachers, and maybe that's why I love teaching, but I never got any training until I joined Fresno State. Thanks very much to my colleagues for having made the decision to hire. And as soon as I got here, a year later, President Castro was hired in, Discovery was launched, Susan Helrod said, the dean at the time of CSM, College of Science and Math, said, Joe, I think you should be involved. I said, cool, somebody knows about me. I'm not an early adopter of technology. I had never held a tablet before Dr. Castro handed it to me at this event in 2014. But I realized that there were some useful things you could do with technology in the classroom. Again, I'm not going to read the details, but these are a number of things that I learned climbing Mount St. Helens. These are all applicable to us employing any sort of innovation, not just technology, but anything new in the classroom. One of the ones that I'll highlight here is be purposeful. What I mean by that is if you try something new on students, you might get some pushback. Or if you try something new on your colleagues, you might get some pushback. So it's important to go in pre-armed with an argument for why this is a useful approach. Is there evidence behind the practice? Are you trying to are you going to be able to convince them that they're not hamsters, not wheels, and that you're trying something and you have no idea if it's going to work or not? The most important thing I think about innovation is mindset. And again, since I never had any instruction on how to instruct, I mimicked what I learned in university. The professor standing up in front, the lectern, maybe an overhead projector with some transparencies on it, it was in the 90s. And talking, and we'd dutifully copy down, we'd go home and study, and we'd do some practice with problems from the end of the chapter, the textbook, and so forth. My perspective, and you don't have to agree with me, is that that's something that we mimic in part because it's comfortable. I love my PowerPoint slides. It's safe. I control the environment. But maybe it's a little bit too static, and maybe it's even boring for the people that are sitting in the audience. You can probably use some credit right now and pull. How are we doing? What's the temperature in the room? Is everybody bored? Are you engaged? What I love is this other extreme. And I've only thought about this recently, the blank chalkboard. Lots of opportunity for doing something new, unique, responding to student needs on the fly if you don't prepare in advance. A little bit scary. What happens if you're the professor and you show up, and I've only started doing this recently, and say, you come to class prepared having watched the videos I filmed for you and having read the chapter of the textbook. If you ask me questions about what you don't understand, and we'll spend our valuable in-class time, this is not my idea, by the way, we'll spend our valuable in-class time answering your questions and making sure you understand the material. So it's adaptive, and I think it's invigorating, but I know a lot of faculty don't feel that way. They'd rather be on that side of the spectrum. So the big question, which I'm still thinking about, is how do we get from the left side to the right side? My personal opinion is succeed by failure. And this is something that I first learned from Jose Bowen. Yeah, who's the president of Goucher College. He came and gave a talk a couple of years ago at our Technology Innovations and Pedagogy Workshop. One of the best things that he was saying we could do would be to fail in front of students and show that it's okay to fail or to have obstacles occur during the class, especially when you're using all this technology. Sometimes things go wrong. That's when you need the backup. But it's okay because then students see it's okay to have things not go well. Model how to adapt to those situations for your students. So now what I'm going to do, that's my brief introductory lecture, so to speak, that I would normally do five minutes, ten minutes in the start of your class. Now we're going to see if the technology works. I'm going to jump that. Normally in class,
class, I will show you what I can see on my laptop here, which is the answers to the quizzes you just took. It's a no stress. And what I'd love to tell you is your answers to the third question, which was, what is it you'd like me to talk about now? Because again, remember, the point is, I want you to take something useful. <coughs> and this is exactly what I do with my students. What is it you don't understand? What is it you'd like to hear about? <coughs> Looking through the answers, it looks like most of you say, well, I'm either lecture capture or student digital collaboration. So I can talk briefly about both of those. Here. This is when I get to improv. You told me what you want to hear about. So those of you that said you want to learn about student digital collaboration, what thing? Best practices. We're doing lecture capture right now. That's easy. I've got an app that I use that records everything. I'll post it later online for everybody to watch again. Like. My students do. Yeah. So, obviously, I I do this too because I was in second cohort. But my issue with students, and I know everybody has a certain thing that they want, but how do you scale this up to online practices or to large group instruction? And I, how do you get the students involved in that digitally? Because that's my main concern. Scaling it, yes. So. Karen, one of my. That may not be a No, that's totally fine. Karen, yeah, also a Discovery faculty fellow and teaches large courses. So, who here teaches anything that's over 50 students of enrollment, let's say? So, about half of the audience, maybe. So, it's a relevant question, too. And look, I'm using technology. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining me. This is a big question that right now a lot of us are trying to get a grip on is exactly best practices for what to do in large classes. My largest class right now, I'm teaching a class of 80, which is kind of borderline. It's not auditorium style teaching. But what we've learned from what we've heard from our colleagues is that one of the best practices there is to get your institution to provide TAs, right? or at least a few that can go out in the audience and help facilitate small group discussions and one of the great things, at least, that we have on campus here, if not lots of TAs, are supplemental instruction programs for those large classes. And if we can marry together discovery or tablet-based teaching or any sort of technology-based teaching with SI, that's a win. And then we also have, well, we have APMs that let us have some support for large classes and those sorts of things as well. But yeah, we're trying to figure that out at the moment. So, we need to do is get feedback from those of you that have large classes and how are you managing student learning, especially active learning in those classes. Other questions? Digital collaboration. How do you balance the trade off between I have a device in front of me receiving text messages and Facebook alerts versus I'm engaged in what you're doing because I have a device in front of me? How do you discourage the former? The only thing I do to discourage students from using their devices for non-class uses is just to try to make it explicit on day one. I spend a lot of time the first week of class dealing with technology and philosophy. I just tell them my philosophy is you're here, you're paying money to be here, presumably. And it's up to you whether or not you spend that time in class benefiting from what I'm trying to help you do or not. So my personal philosophy as an instructor is as long as they're not distracting other students. That's okay. And if they are distracting other students, then I ask them to kind of stop or to go outside and chat with people. Or whatever. But another good thing that we need lots of clients to be thinking about is it varies from instructor to instructor the tolerance for use of technology. Mary, Paul, and I, Mary and I believe early, are both faculty cohort leads in the Chancellor's Office's Course Redesign with Technology Initiative. So we each need discipline-based cohorts of faculty across the CSU redesigning their courses with technology. I was on a Zoom session, a conference call, video conference, with my cohort last week. One of my cohort members said, oh, I really hate letting students doing any, letting them do anything with technology. It's once they get it out and get sucked in and they're not paying attention anymore. I thought, you're in the course redesign of technology program, but you don't want to use mobile. That's fine. There are lots of different types of technology. 
So it is definitely an issue that a lot of us can tackle. And I think it's just a, it's a personal choice for the faculty. Do you, do you ask the students to take out the devices or not? And it's pretty straightforward to, to build in those practices and say, for the first five minutes of class, we're all going to use our devices, we're going to do some polling, then I'm going to ask everybody to put it away. And if you're consistent about that, students seem to be pretty good about adhering to that request, other than the students that didn't care anyway, which is text underneath the desk. Yeah. Um, what is your And you have to offer them a carrot to do that. I do offer students a carrot to watch the videos. It's just a Socratic quiz at the start or the end of the class. Usually I do both. I do an online quiz, two or three questions max, like we did here today. At the start and at the end, and they don't know which one is going to be the one that gets graded either. So I get great attendance. Students are there at the start and through the end. And it's just a point. Point a day, I built it into the syllabus, and then if I decide that I want that to be a tiny fraction of the total grade, then I make the exams worth 7,000 points or something. So it can be a small period. But the, this semester, and I'll show you in a couple of minutes, this semester, video watching has gone through the roof, which is really cool. And I think it's for a few reasons that I, a few ways that I tweaked my class. And what I'm going to do. <laughs> since there are technical difficulties. So I'll send those, and it happens. I'll send those URLs to you. And by the way, this flyer that I have prepared for have a backup plan in case things go wrong, has a link, the top link under resources, my YouTube channel. This video will be posted there, and you can also get a lot of other information at that website. And I'll post some other links there too. So what I can do with YouTube is I can go in and I can see how many students watch the video. Does it record that one? It does. Okay. YouTube is fantastic. It's got all of this built in. And all you have to do is go to YouTube and there's an analytics page. I'd be happy, I'm going to give you the punchline now, I would be happy to visit every one of you individually and show you how to do this if you want. So my contact information is on this sheet. Please contact me and let me know if I can help in any way. Wait, sorry, my department chair didn't say that. Sorry. Get back in the lab. Yeah. <laughs> so in a nutshell, that's kind of a brief <coughs> tour of what I normally do during a day in class. You start with the quiz, I get your feedback, what would you like to learn about, I spend some time in the answering questions on the fly. I'm not prepared for that. It's exciting, it's engaging, it's interesting. And at least I know I'm connecting with the students that are asking questions. Some of them in the back might not be paying attention, but they're usually the ones that aren't paying attention anyway. So for those of you that have, again, devices, like one or two more quiz. <coughs> Exactly the same way. And this is the last step in the process. Some of you are going to be seeing screens that say, wait, the instructor's trying to do something. There you go. So other questions while you all tell me what you learned today so far. Questions. One is how this um, your schedule in the classroom changes from the 50 minute to the one hour and 15 minutes. And the second question is how um, your office hours. Usually during the office hours, there yeah, was a call and find out who could all feel comfortable in a, in a classroom setting asking. So, have you changed in terms of the profile of students that you get in the office hours or anything? So, I'll answer the second question first because that might take me a little bit longer. So, the question essentially is what happens to students in office hours when we spend so much time in class doing QA? Unfortunately, this semester I also made points available for my students to come see me in office hours for my 90 student, 80 student class. So I want to make sure that every student knows where my office is and has come and asked me, it has to be a genetics question. They can't just come say, hi, I'm here for my point. They have to come ask me an engaging question about our topic. 
and then they earn points for that. So I have been seeing many more students early in the semester than I normally do. But I'm also getting a lot more students in my office anyway because they've now realized I'm approachable and they're used to me. And I think this has been a really beneficial thing. Before, I would only see students in my office hours when? Just before something is due. The other thing I love about what we're doing now with the lecture capture recording is I don't just record classes, which I hate to call lectures anymore because it's not really lecturing, is I record my office hours. When students come to class and they say, I didn't really understand this thing we talked about in class. If I'm drawing on a whiteboard, something, a diagram or a mathematical equation or whatever, I draw it on this instead, record it, post it on YouTube. The whole class then gets to benefit from the question that student asks. They can all go whenever they want, not just during my office hours. Anytime they have a question about that topic, they can go to YouTube and watch my drawn response. That's kind of boring. They're, all they're watching is something that looks like this with me, handless, faceless me, just a stylus, you know, ink appears on the screen. It's a little bit disappointing. Ah, so, yeah, for a slightly longer class, what do you do? I would build in some planted questions, not planted in the audience, but I would plant some questions in during the conversation that we're having, just in case the conversation runs dry. But in my 15 minute classes, I have not yet had a time when there weren't students that were still asking questions or follow on questions. And so, one of the things that I'm doing most recently is the quiz. The, Sorry, the movies that I ask students to watch before class. At the very end of the movie, I record, this is a question I'd like to think about for class. So I know at the very least, when I start class, if nobody has a question, I can go right into, okay, <clears throat> figure out how to solve that problem or answer that question. Or who has a question about how to solve that problem. <coughs> It looks like some people actually learned something based on our quiz, and that's fantastic because I then know that I achieved my goal. And I know that from some of you, there is more information you'd like to have. Maybe next time, I, well, there may not be next time. Next time I get to stand up here and talk about innovation or pedagogy, I've got some topics that I know that you want to hear about. So where do I think innovation is headed next? And I, there's more time later after him is given his presentation for questions and answers also. So we don't have to do all the q and now, and I'll stick around afterwards as well. So things I'm thinking about in the near future, in terms of innovation, what's the future of innovation? Yikes. Hey. This concept of being flexible in the classroom, and me at least trying to get away from creating PowerPoint slots, having this fixed series of topics that I want to march through during class, one of the changes that I made this semester, again in, in the flipped genetics class, was not, I love giving students lecture slides in advance. They love it too. They give me all sorts of positive feedback on student evaluations about, we love having the materials that we're going to go through in class before we do it. So you can take notes on your PowerPoint slides. But I think that also dampens the students feeling like they can be, we can be dynamic in class. I think they see and I, from a little bit of student feedback I have, I think this is true. I think they see, oh man, there's 50 PowerPoint slides for today. I better shut up and sit down and listen to Dr. Ross talk. And even though I say I'd love you to ask questions, why providing that information in advance gives me less flexibility. It gives the students the appearance that I'm less flexible. So I'm trying to move more away from lecture slides to not. And then I don't spend hours preening some of us don't, some of us do tweaking things and massaging images and scaling them just right, making sure all the fonts are the same sizes and colors and those sorts of things. So much more time to do other things now. When I'm actively not preparing to teach, but I am preparing to teach, but in a different style. Some place we're definitely headed is getting students involved in creating course materials. This, so these are Assignments where I ask students to draw, for example, what is the relationship between a picture of a chromosome and a double helix of DNA? How are they related to each other? And I get some pretty 
artistic things. And a lot of students don't think that biology can be artistic. It, it's a science. I'm, I've got an artistic frame of mind, and I'm not good at biology, but I get some fantastic things that students would let me use in presentations to show off what students know and understand about their discipline. <coughs> A few examples of quotes that students have given about these lecture videos, which has freed up the class to do so much more than just me regurgitating information in people. And these sorts of things drop on my student evaluations now all the time. And I do want to highlight that right now, thanks in part to funding from the provost office, we have this whiteboard set up on the ground floor of the library. You can go in, and there are some examples of these. Here's a URL down at the bottom. You can visit if you want. And links are all on my YouTube channel that you've got the URL to. You stand behind this piece of glass and you draw it. Students can see you and what you're doing at the same time. And it's fantastic. They love this way more than watching this. Students like this. They like the same. I like having a whole 50 minute video of whatever we did in class because if I missed something or if I was taking a note on something or if I didn't understand a term, I can go back and review and rewatch and rewatch and rewatch if I have to. But they also like the feeling of being engaged by seeing the picture. So both of these types of video are going to be very useful. So, what can you do to innovate? A couple of great opportunities to get engaged. One is the Chancellor's Office Course Redesign and Technology Initiative, which I mentioned previously, provides great resources, including WTUs, tech funds, funds for purchasing technology, for student assistance in the classroom, for captioning videos if you decide to produce videos because these materials need to be accessible to all of our students that we might have in our classes. More specifically, I'd love to invite everybody here to come to these Discovery Faculty Learning Community Brown Bags. Mary, Paul, and I are also co-chairs of this faculty learning community. And the whole point is these are drop-in sessions. We've scheduled them at different times during the day, different hours, and different weekdays. So hopefully, every one of you can make at least one of those. <coughs> those are ten. Come ask us questions about how to use any sort of technology in the classroom. That's what these are have a problem like I asked you to devise in your mind, you've got a problem or something you think you can solve with technology and some people to bounce ideas off of and can practice using so that the first time you go up in front of the class it's not the first time you've tried doing something, please come visit us. We'd love to help. And then the final challenge I've already posed to you. Please invite me to come to your class. I can give you feedback on how I think the technology might help especially efficiency in the classroom. Or come visit one of my classes. One of my favorite quotes that I remember from my Latin instructor, it is, nihil novum sub sole, there's nothing new under the sun. Everything came from something. And you can't innovate without having somebody to stand on the shoulders of. So these are a long list of people that I would certainly need to think. Mary Paul for nominating me for this award, for all of the people that are involved in administration of Discovery, my fellow Discovery faculty fellows, the guides on the go, great front line of defense. And by the way, here, another thing I meant to mention, that the support that Fresno State gives the Discovery faculty for in-class tech support is fantastic, including student employees, the guides on the go, who come to classes and sit in the classes and are on the spot ready to help in case technology issues. That's fantastic. Back to the learning community, the IT and the classroom video services department, the Center for Faculty Excellence, and Eric West, who is the person that controls that light board, that fantastic monitor with the glowing ink, that lets me do the lecture, the pre lecture recordings, the course redesign and technology team. Some of this, or a lot of this, was stolen from Mary Pastein, stolen, innovated from Mary Pastein, a biologist at CSUN. And I also mentioned Jose Bowen, who has been the inspiration for a lot of what I've done. Susan, as I mentioned previously, the chairs, both past and present, for supporting all of this work that I do in the classroom and outside of the classroom. And, and beyond the chairs, the deans, the provost, thank you very much for this honor, and President Castro for his bold vision. And I would be remiss.
remiss without acknowledging my family, who barely see me because I'm in my office recording and captioning lecture videos, and maybe mentioning one other family member, my great uncle, who's no longer with us, Bonnie, it's been a couple of years, but um, a groundbreaking biologist in my family. And this was a quote that was mentioned in his celebration of life. This is a quote from Newton, by the way, some probably don't recognize it. It's a quote that's attributed anyway to Isaac Newton. But uh, it was a way that a lot of my uncle Andy's colleagues remembered him by. He, any plant biologists in the room? Any botanists? No. I'll tell you later. Thank you very much for your attention, and here's some contact information, and we move on.